Friends, good evening. Thank you for joining us this evening to another of our pre-chamber lecture lectures. Tonight, we're going into a two-part lecture. We're going to discuss tonight the many faces of the ego. It is likely that in the newsletter that you received, uh, the title of the lecture is Some Egos to Study or Some Egos to Consider. All those titles are perfectly fine. Because the key here is that we need to start doing a deep dive so that we can understand what these defects are. But before we do that, let's make sure that we baseline ourselves, all of us, understanding what is the ego. Because some people think that the ego is something that exists right now, right here, it is somewhere inside of me, and uh, I have to deal with it, and the ego is bad, so I separate myself from it, and when I'm suffering, I say it is because of my ego. So all of those mental postures are uh, insufficient. They are exceedingly superficial, and they are indicative of someone who still does not have a good understanding. I would like for us to break through that today. And for you to walk out of this lecture with a level of understanding on what is the ego and what to look for, like you have not seen before. So let's start by saying that the ego is not just one thing. Yes, you have heard lust and you have heard anger and jealousy, etc. But we mean beyond that. The ego is many things. And let's start by saying the ego is one, just one, as the Kunda buffer organ. All of you have seen at some point some cartoon of the devil, and you have seen that the devil, usually referred to as Satan, uh, has a tail. And Satan's tail is always pointing downward. That tail that arrow that is pointing downwards into the infernal abyss of man. That is the Kunda buffer organ. And the Kunda buffer organ never existed before. The Kunda buffer organ was given to humanity with a specific purpose. And there is a good story behind that. Let's see if we can summarize that story in like a minute or so to not get you too distracted. For those of you who have participated in our lecture, The Seven Races, you would remember that we discussed the story that exists about the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, and the, and the eating of the forbidden fruit. That story took place in the third sub-race of the Lemurian race. But before then, before then, as the planet was still in its infancy, as this planet Earth was still going through some transitions, the prior races that existed, the polar race, which was the first race, the Hyperborean race, which was the second, and the beginnings of the Lemurian race, the planet was so unstable that these great beings, they were incarnating here, they were saying, this is too much. This is just, this planet is just too much. So they were literally abandoning their body. And our physical bodies are necessary because the physical body receives energy from the cosmos. It gets digested through the body and we deliver it through our feet, to the planet. Everything on the cortex does that. Everything on that organic layer in the earth crusts does that. So we digest those energies and we hand them and we hand them to the planet. And in the same token, when the planet feeds itself, it releases energies through the cosmos that flow through us and we help transform them and they are released into the the vastness of the universe, and other planets in our solar system feed from those energies. So our planet Earth was just too unstable. And there were some archangels who decided that they were going to give the Kunda buffer organ to humans. That tail 
to the human bodies so that when the bodies digested those cosmic energies, they would digest them in such a way that the planet will nourish itself, perhaps we could say better, and would stabilize faster. But the moment that happened, we started developing a very strong affinity towards the things of substance, towards the things that we can touch, towards everything that we can perceive. And Samael says this in his writings. He says, the archangel who plays the Kunda buffer organ in humanity, he made a mathematical mistake. And that organ remained in the human bodies for too long. Yes, they removed it, but the effect of the Kunda buffer organ remained marking the five cylinders of the human machine. For those of you who have never heard of the five cylinders, the intellect, the emotion, the habits, the instincts, and the sexuality. Those five cylinders. So the ego is one as the Kunda buffer organ. There was a time in which the humanities that lived here, they just did not want to be in the planet because the planet was too unstable physically. And after the Kunda buffer organ, we all developed like this very strong affinity with the dense substance. And this has a consequence because it affects the way that we think, the way that we feel, the way that we behave, the way that we use our sexual energies, the way that we react. So the ego is one as the Kunda buffer organ. The bigger problem with this is that we have been abusing for so long of our bodies, abusing with, with alcohol, with a lack of sleep, with uh, poor nourishment, with lack of exercise, with uh, the much garbage that we get through the television and the movies, etc., etc., that we have strengthened that Kunda buffer organ. And this is a challenge. Because now, this is something that we have to revert. So the ego is one as this hypnotic force that is the Kunda buffer organ that moves us into identifying with anything that we can perceive through our five senses. But beyond that, the ego is also three. And the ego is three as three particular demons. There is a demon of desire that in the story of the great master Jesus is symbolized by Judas. That demon of desire is that inferior aspect inside each and every one of us that sells the inner savior just for the pleasures of the world. Those pleasures of the world are symbolized in the story of Jesus by those silver coins that Judas received when he betrayed the master. But every time that we betray that silent voice inside of us, that voice that says, this is a good moment to go meditate, and you say, eh, maybe later, let me finish watching some TV. At that moment, we have taken in that payment on those silver coins, those things that are desirable, and we have negated the work that we should have been doing. But the ego is also a demon of the mind. And that is symbolized by Pilate. And Pilate is the one who washed his hands. He demonstrated with that that he was not guilty, not responsible, that he had nothing to do with the execution of the great master Jesus. And in the same way, there is an aspect of our ego that is a demon of the mind. And it will always look for a way out of trouble of problems, troubles that the ego walks itself into. It wants to talk its way out of them. This, this demon of the mind is the one that justifies all of our mistakes. It is the one that will do the, in, in, the unmentionable just to make sure that it does not assume any responsibility for the wrong that it has done. And this exists in us. And the last one is the demon of ill will. That is Caiaphas. And Caiaphas, or Caiaphas, he was seen back then as a supreme priest. 
as a very respectable man. But what people did not know is that he was the mastermind looking for a way to kill, destroy, crucify the great master Jesus. So on the outside, he was really nice. On the outside, he was very respectful and venerable. But on the inside, all it had was ill will. He wanted to see others destroyed. He wanted the best things for himself. He thought that everything else was wrong except his own doctrine. And this demon of ill will, it exists in each and every one of us as well. So we have a demon of desire, a demon of the mind, and a demon of ill will. So when somebody says, what is the ego? Now you can start seeing that the answer is a little bit more complicated. Because it is a series of hypnotic impulses that are symbolized by the Kunda Buffer organ. But it is also a demon of desire, a demon of the mind, a demon of ill will. And beyond that, the ego is also seven. It is one, it is three, and it is seven. And the ego is seven as what you have come to know as the seven deadly sins. Everybody has heard, everybody has heard of greed, of envy, of anger, of lust, of pride, of laziness, of gluttony. Each one of those is an aspect of the ego that we must learn to comprehend and that we need to learn how to eliminate. Some people think, ah, oh, see, if I have to do this, then let me get some affirmations. And then they can go into their books and they can find affirmations that say, I am not gluttonous or I am not lustful or I am not angry. But these are only exercises of the mind. The ego that exists in us today has its own mind. It has its own willpower. It has its own desires, its own commitments. And the ego has that ability because every time that one of these egos, psychological aggregates, as they are known in the Buddhist tradition, every time one of these psychological aggregates is formed, it takes a little fraction of our consciousness. What is our consciousness? In some books, our consciousness is referred to as the essence. In other books, our consciousness is referred to as the psyche. In other books, it is referred to as Buddha or Tathagata. These are all different names for the same thing. The consciousness that exists in us is the only aspect of our spirit that we have incarnated. This consciousness is just a mere fraction of the human soul of our innermost, of our spirit. And it has all of the abilities and powers and faculties of the human soul of the innermost. But it is just that it is infinitely different. It is like comparing the soul of the innermost, like a bonfire raging, and our consciousness, like a little spark that escapes out of that bonfire. You see, they are the same, but at the same time, infinitely different. And every time one of these egos is created, there is a little fraction of that consciousness that remains trapped in there. And the consciousness just gets trapped within the mind and the desires and the ill will and everything else of the ego. So the ego is one, and it is three, and it is seven. But we also said that the ego is many things. <laughs> so I guess that we, we are compelled to say, but wait, because there's still more. <laughs> because the ego is also a multiplicity. Every one of those seven deadly sins that we carry within has many faces many different masks, and some of them are horrendous. Some of them are even scary. You have seen somebody who is blind with anger. 
You have seen that when people get enraged, they become very dangerous. And that is certainly something terrible to witness. But there are also faces of anger that will appear to be very friendly. Masks of anger in which people give advice to others. They pretend to be good friends, but there is some venom behind that ill-willed advice. So every one of those seven has many different faces. And all of those many different faces combined, they constitute what is known as the Legion. And this is all of our psychological aggregates together. There is a story uh, in the sacred scriptures in the Bible where this concept of the Legion is presented. So happens that the great master Jesus with his disciple, well, his disciples, well, they get on the ship and they cross across the Sea of Galilee. And when they get onto the other side, as they are disembarking, the crowd just gathers together at the pier. And everybody is cheering and waiting for the master to descend from this ship. And in the distance, there was a deranged man. A very violent man. And he was so violent that he had to be chained. And to keep him away from people, not only he was chained, but he was chained in a graveyard. And that man from a distance was witnessing the crowd gathering to receive the great master. And he saw the great master descending from the ship. And from that distance, that, my, that man started screaming, Jesus I conjure you, do not torment me. The great master Jesus, in Hebrew, Yeshua, that means the Savior, the internal Savior. He descends and he makes his way to the crowd. And he goes to that man who was chained down. And he puts his hand on that man and he says, What is your name? And the man says, my name is Legion, because we're many. And at that moment, with his infinite love and his infinite kindness, Jesus expelled all of those demons from the man. And those demons needed somewhere to go, and there was a herd of pigs nearby. So they possessed the bodies of the pigs, and the pigs got so enraged, and they got so traumatized with this, that in their savagery, they just jumped off a cliff, and they drowned themselves in the waters. This is that story. That legion is this one that we're seeing on the screen. This legion is the many phases of the many psychological aggregates that we are carrying within. And now it is our job to willingly, voluntarily observe them, comprehend them, and invoke of a power superior to the mind to eliminate them. That power is the power of what you have heard before as Devi Kundalini. Kundalini, who is our Divine Mother, she is the only one with the power to destroy the ego. You can recite as many affirmations as you want, and that ego is going to harden itself. You can think that you can suppress the ego by forcing yourself to be virtuous. Well, yes, that is a good action, forcing yourself to be virtuous. But if the ego is not eliminated, you are forcing it into deeper levels of the mind and that is going to become more work later. So we have to observe, comprehend, and eliminate each one of these defects. How many defects do we have? <laughs> it's a difficult question to answer. Samael says, behind every thought and behind every action, there is a psychological aggregate. So as you observe your day, you will have a good idea on what that is. So let's start with some egos to comprehend, some of the many phases of the ego, and we can start with pride. Because we all know very well what pride is. We all know very well how is it that we experience pride in the many different ways, whether it is thought, 
or in sentiment or within our physicality as well. Pride is something uh, that in some aspects it's, it makes us feel very good about ourselves and we just express this joy about the quality of the work that we have done or the sacrifices that we have made and we refer to some of that as an element of pride. I want you to take this even beyond that and to see that in pride there is vainglory. Pride is conflictive because pride blinds us from understanding that we are not as great as we think that we really are. How many times have we not seen ourselves wanting to help someone? And we go and we either do something or we tell them something and the result becomes something that we were not expecting. Suddenly, you see that the situation has become worse. And what do you say? My God, that is not what I meant. Or that is not what I, what, what I wanted to say. Or I didn't think that was going to happen. But thinking that we know better, thinking that we are superior, thinking that we somehow have a better position or posture than someone else, right then and there, we are seeing clearly the elements of pride. And there are some faces of pride that are way more, dif more dangerous than others. Because yes, you can wash the bathroom in your house and after two hours of scrubbing, you can stand at the door and just put your hands on your waist and say, this has been a good job. I feel pride about this. Okay, we can get that. But there are some faces of pride that are very dangerous. And one of those faces is the defect of mythomania. The defect of mythomania is a defect that is very common amongst many, many Gnostic students. It is very common among students from pseudo-esoteric schools, from students of spiritism, from students of mediumism, etc. And mythomania it's an aspect of pride that leads the person to believe that they are exceedingly superior. That they have faculties, powers, virtues, that they know so much about the esoteric knowledge, and they consider themselves to be saints and saviors of others. These defects are so dangerous that they have such a powerful magnetic attraction that other people just gravitate towards them and they believe all of their lies. A good example, we have it on the screen. This man is a 66 year old man, by this time must be in his 70s, who lives outside of the capital of Brazil and he claims to be the reincarnation of Jesus the Christ. He calls himself Inri Cristo. And one thing that Samael does for us is that he strives to teach all of the students that decide to follow his works to learn how to think. He makes no effort at all to try to convince anyone. He focuses all of his writings into making sure that those who study his works, that they can develop quality of thought. And if we observe this specific scenario, we know that someone who would claim to be the reincarnation of Jesus, well, that does, that does not stand any reasonable test. Because we know that the great master of masters, something that we will cover as we walk into our intermediate level studies. He is a master that is not only a resurrected master, but who has completed some special work, which is known as the work of the three mountains, seven consecutive times. And as that work is done, well, of course, he is a resurrected master, but that means that he has gone through special processes working with other entities of creation, other, other gods of creation to be able to resurrect that body, reanimate it, and for that body to be reabsorbed in a way that is very superior. Resurrected means that he has his own physical body. 
It means that the body was victorious over the processes of death. And if you have your own body, how can someone else claim that they are you? You see, this is the kind of stuff. And many people just follow this. But there are many others even more dangerous than Mr. Henri Cristo, who have been able to betray and deprive many families of opportunities, of the wealth that they had, of the funds that they had to be able to put their children to school or take care of illnesses. Lamentably, that is what mythomania does. But there is also the defect of vanity. And vanity is one of those many faces of pride. And you know vanity, because vanity is something that we see in the mirror every day. Particularly in the morning when we're making ourselves ready to go to school or go to work. Because you wake up and as you brush your teeth and you walk into your closet or you're looking in your wardrobe to see what you're going to be wearing, you do not pick anything at random. The egos of vanity will make sure that you select the right colors. That you select the right combinations. That you select those things that are going to make you look your best. And on top of that, as you're wearing them and you are applying your makeup or doing your hair or, or, or fixing your beard, etc., etc., you will not move away from the mirror until the mirror says, you look really good now. Now you can go. And these are aspects of vanity. But these are aspects of physical vanity. There is emotional vanity. There are many people who pride themselves into feeling that their personality is so strong and that they can take so much suffering and pain. And they boast about how difficult their life has been. And everywhere they go, everyone knows their story. But there are also aspects of vanity that are intellectual. People who boast about how much they know and they look for every little opportunity to be able to vomit information that they have memorized so that they can impress others. So that others can see, wow, you really know so much. All of this, it builds that inferior fire of pride. And of course, as part of that vanity, that intellectual vanity, well, we see it right here. This intellectual that tends to look for solutions that are more complicated than what they should be. For someone that the moment that you ask them something and they just don't know the answer, they feel themselves attacked. And they feel themselves threatened because you asked them something and the moment that they gave the answer, you certainly was not enough for you. And because you asked someone else, they get offended. Because how dare you go and ask somebody else if I am the one who knows. This is the intellectual pride that many of us carry. We can also speak about an aspect of pride that is very mystical. There are many people who are willing to play dramas. Dramas that will result in physical harm. Simply because the more mystical they demonstrate that they are, in this case, somebody who would be willing to be whipped, uh, to be even literally crucified, uh, well, they take this as I am willing to go through this hardship and you don't. And as a consequence, I must be more deservant of the grace of God and make better progress spiritually than you because you're not willing to do this that I do. This is some of what the mystical pride does. And beyond that, so many other faces that we would need perhaps a couple more lectures to cover a few more. There are aspects of pride that have to do with self-importance, with self-sufficiency, with conceitedness, with idolatry, with preponence. All of these faces of pride exist in each and every one of us. Now let's talk a little bit about lust. We start with pride, and we will talk about pride and lust and envy first, because these three are by far the secret spring of action of all of our reactions. 
Psychological aggregates of lust are the ones responsible for all of us to be trapped here in this wheel of samsara. Those of you who may have heard that before, the wheel of samsara or samsara is the wheel of life. It is what in Buddhism is known as the wheel of becoming. This is the wheel that brings us back into a physical body, life after life after life. And in the book of Genesis, we find a clear story on how we said that lust is responsible for our fallen human condition. All of you know the story? You all know that there was a woman and there was a man, Adam and Eve, and they lived in this paradise. And this was a realm of peacefulness and beauty. And they had access to everything in that beautiful garden. And there were two specific trees at the center of the garden itself. There was the tree of life. That tree of life is a tree that has 10 particular fruits. And it's a beautiful tree. It exists in all of the great cultures of the world. And then there was another tree, which was known as the tree of the science of good and evil. The Kabbalistic tradition says that these two trees, that they shared the same roots. And that is so interesting. The Spirit of God spoke to both Adam and Eve, and he said, You may enjoy of the fruit of all of the trees in the garden, except of the tree of the science of good and evil. Do you remember this? And it so happens that Eve happened to be wandering around the garden, and then there was this very uh, sleazy creature. It was a tempting serpent. But notice that this is, a, this is a very special serpent. This serpent is the Kunda buffer organ. This is the, the, the serpent of temptation. And this particular serpent, different than what many people think, it is not a scary serpent. It is not something that people would run away from. This serpent is very eloquent. It is very enchanting. It is very inviting. This particular serpent will lure you in and will convince you exactly as it convinced Eve. Because it started by saying, hey, what's up? <laughs> and as Eve approached the serpent, said, how come you're not eating of this tree? And Eve says, well, because if we eat of this, we have been told that we will perish, that we will die. And the serpent says, nah. What's going to happen is that if you eat of this, you're going to know as much as they do. And the moment you consume of this, the moment that you know as much of the, as the gods do, you will by consequence also be a god. And this was very interesting to Eve. Notice that in the Garden of Eden, the Spirit of God says, don't eat of this fruit, because if you do, you will die. But you know the story. You know that Adam and Eve did not die. So what happened? Well, what happens is that people do not truly understand the meaning of some words. Because death, yes, we can think of death as the cessation, the stopping of all the biological functions of the body. And of course, the body will pff, die. But beyond that, death means the loss of the senses. And we're dealing here with a lot of superior senses. Omniscience, clairvoyance, magical ear, telepathy, dominion over the elements of air, water, earth, fire, etc. That is the death that is referred to. If you eat of the fruit of this tree, you will lose your ability to control all of that. And that is exactly what happened. So Eve, Lord, went and she ate of the fruit. So let us tell you this. This Garden of Eden, this beautiful earth, is a philosophical earth. And that philosophical earth is a symbol of the physical body. Your body has the potential to become that Garden of Eden, symbolically. The tree of, 
of the science of good and evil is intimately associated with the sexuality of man. We know this because this is what has been taught in all of the serpentine cultures, in all of the cultures that 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 give cult of fire, whether they are the mysteries of Mithra or of Eleusis, uh, the ancient Babylonians, the ancient Nordics, the Maya, the Aztecs, the Egyptians, etc., etc., etc. The tree of the science of good and evil is at the center of the garden, and it is symbolized by the creative organs in the human body. So, in that light, Eve is a symbol of our sexuality. Adam is a symbol of the mind. And when Eve consumed of the fruit, of that forbidden fruit, you already know what that means. And the shock that those sexual organs received was so much that they affected the mind. That is why Adam also ate of the fruit. And suddenly they realized that they had made a mistake. Suddenly they saw themselves naked and they were expelled from the garden. Right there we see the effect of lust. Lust does not care about sex, origin, caste. It does not care about religious preference. It does not care about your social status. Lust does not care if you're at work or if you're at the hospital. It does not care if you're putting your family at risk or if you're not going to satisfy your financial commitments. All that lust cares about is on satisfying its voracious appetite for sensation. And that sensation is severely magnified at the level of the sexual organs. And we have to comprehend the many phases of our lust. One of these phases is the phase of adultery. Some people confuse adultery with fornication. They are not the same. Fornication happens every time that you stimulate your sexual organs in such a way that you expel from your body what is known as the creative waters, the ens seminis. And when that happens, well, there is fornication. You have taken a precious substance within the body that we dedicate many hours of lectures to explain. And these waters are meant to satisfy needs of the physical body. And when you transmute it, just like when Jesus transmuted water into wine, when we transmute our creative waters into the wine of the Spirit, they have the power to transform us. That is fornication. But adultery happens whenever you have sexual encounters with someone that does not belong to you. Let's not get caught up in the belonging, because we're not speaking here about property. But we do know that we all have a twin soul. We all know that there is a special someone here for each one of us. And when we commit ourselves to working with someone, and we get married and we start uh, enjoying of that life of marriage and of course sexuality becomes part of that intimate life the more we exchange sexually with one another the more the woman starts leaving a magnetic signature an imprint in the man and at the same time the more the man leaves a magnetic signature an imprint in the woman when after some time of abusing the sexual creative energy, well, there is a distancing that happens in the couple. Let's not get into that tonight. But when the man leaves the home and he gets in intimate contact with another woman, then the magnetic imprint that he had already imprinted within him becomes corrupted. Because now he gets to that other woman with some energy. The energy of that woman is different. And when they unite themselves sexually, her energy corrupts the energy that is already within him. It is the equivalent of you taking one of those 
uh, 1980s long playing records, those albums, you would remember some of you, and scratching it and trying to play it, it's no longer useful. It looks fine, but it just does not generate the right symphony, the right harmony. Of course, women have a sense of intuition that is more developed than that of man. And when that happens, well, the wife, she intuitively knows that something has changed. She knows that something has happened. She may not have the evidence, but she knows. And if that has ever happened to you, you know. This is adultery. Adultery happens whenever we corrupt those magnetic imprints by sharing ourselves sexually with more than one person. That is what happens in the case of the man. Certainly, there is very serious karma that is applied because of adultery. But what happens to the woman? What happens to that woman who gives herself to, to have sexual relationship with several men? Well, that woman then becomes as a receptor, as an, an electrical circuit, as that, as that part that receives the energy. Well, she then connects the first man with the second, and the second with the third, and the third with the first. And all those men start sharing their karmas. This is why you see that whenever a man starts sharing himself with women who have been with other men, his life becomes miserable fast. He becomes intolerant. They lose the, the gallantry, the handsomeness. All of that eventually goes away, but it goes away really fast. And that is because they start sharing an additional karmic burden. So let's say this tonight. If out of this lecture, the only thing that you take back is how impactful and how harmful is adultery. <laughs> and you just bring that into your consciousness and you never give yourself to ever do it. This has been a huge win tonight. This is adultery. But let's continue. Then, <clears throat> with lust, there are those who love the idea of having sexual encounters everywhere they go. They love to go on spring break and they love to go on fall break somewhere else and they have a girlfriend here and a girlfriend there. All of these men, they are known as Don Juans. And women, well, they don't stay behind. Women also do the same thing. But instead of called, being called Don Juan, they're called Madame Ines. These, all of these psychological aggregates have a very special, special psychology. They see themselves very gallant doing this. They see themselves very committed. They see themselves as very loving. They will even not hesitate to just get into a fight to the death for the honor of the woman, you see? But this is a very inferior mindset. At the end of the day, both the Don Juan and the Dona Ines they are suffering all of the consequences of adultery. And that woman is spreading karma like a wildfire. And that man is corrupting the magnetic signatures that could be inscripted in him and the canvas on which those magnetic signatures could be stenciled. And eventually, his body becomes so corrupted that he's not able to transmute. He is not able to awaken the fire of Kundalini. Those who walk down this path, well, Samael says it very clearly. For them, what awaits them is the second death. And the second death is the descent of the soul into the infernal worlds. Then there is also the Casanova. The Casanova is the one that, well, he likes just everywhere he goes, he wants to have an additional conquest. There is, as part of lust, a very dangerous, dangerous defect. And it is called the vampire eye devil. These creatures are very dangerous. These creatures will use the sexual act to inflict pain, 
mutilate, to bring blood into the exercise and the practice. And they will abuse physically of the woman, or if it is a woman, she will abuse physically of the man. And there will be slicing of the skin, and there will be binding, and there will be tortures. And all of these things will be done in the name of love. Certainly, the vampire eye devil is a very dangerous, lustful, psychological aggregate. And of course, there are other aspects in us, like for example, those egos that love those sensations of the physical body and that they are constantly inviting, well, masturbation. Somebody else says, the more we expel of this creative fluid from within our body, the more we distance ourselves from our inner father. He says, you have found yourself for so many lives making the same mistakes. It is time that you can make a change. Rather than wasting this powerful source of energy that can give you telepathy, clairvoyance, the ability to unfold in your astral body, dominion over water, air, fire, earth, etc. Rather than wasting it, transmute it. Make use of it so that you can regenerate the physical body and awaken all of its faculties. The problem with masturbation is that the creative water, as it is expelled from the body, well, this entity of the semen, this ensemenes, exists both in men and women. Both men and women, as they ejaculate, they, they literally expel the fluid away from the body. And this fluid is so rich in life energy that wherever it lands, it creates a focal point for the growth of incubi, succubi, larvae. Incubi and succubi, these are... We say larvae, we don't want you to think in terms of a maggot, because that is not what it is. Larvae, etymolo etymologically, is a, an evil spirit. And these are inferior creations that have found themselves being born as a product of an inferior action of man. And they will always invite more of the actions that brought them life so that they can nourish themselves. Otherwise, eventually they starve. But what happens? Incubate and succubate, these are these larvae that they fornicate with the many different egos that exist in our psyche. So if you happen to experience orgasms while you are asleep, those wet dreams, that happens because there are some of these mental effigies, some of these incubi, succubi, larvae, and your egos of lust fornicate with these creatures within the realm of dreams. Dear friends, that is the astral plane. And because these egos contain a fraction of your consciousness, and those egos cannot just leave the body, they are connected to the body by a thread that is called the thread of Antakarana. It is a very, a very thin silver thread that keeps the soul bound to the body. This is why every time you wake up in the morning, the soul comes back. Well, the moment that happens, those vibrations, they are transmitted into the body just like vibrations of music flow through the string of a violin. And while the ego is fornicating, those energies, those vibrations are experienced in the physical body and the physical body responds to that because the brain does not know what is happening here and what is happening there. The brain just doesn't know. So the brain perceives that and based on what is happening in the body, it releases the water. This is what happens. If you have had this problem, we will tell you, we will invite you to get a little bit of brimstone, uh, ground sulfur. It is a yellow sulfur dust. And to get a little pinch of that, listen to us, just a little pinch. A little pinch of that and put that in your shoes. Because the ethereal vapors of the sulfur will destroy these larvae. And it will help you, and it will keep you from that problem that is the nocturnal pollutions. So incubate and succubate, they are the product of masturbation. And everywhere where those waters have fallen, 
in the floor, on the bed, in the bathroom, on the clothes, on everywhere. Everywhere where it has landed, some of these creatures will grow. So we have to cleanse our environment. Cleanse your room, cleanse your house, so that we can destroy all of this. These creatures, they have such a, a hypnotic uh, mental effect that they will move your other aggregates of lust to just continue making the same mistakes. Then there are psychological aggregates of masochism and sadism. Here is a good example of the ego that is masochist that seeks to bring about suffering, corporeal suffering, to the physical body. And it will do that in the name of religion. As you can see, it will do that in the name of love, with the best of intentions. But allow us to tell you this. None of the great masters have any interest in seeing us mutilating the physical body. If you walk on your knees for miles and your knees bleed, if you do self-flagellation with blades and your, and, your, and your back looks like this, dear friends, I want you to know that that has no purpose. The only thing that that does for you is to drain your vitalities because the body has to regenerate and heal. That is not going to gain you the grace of the great masters. If you want to earn that grace, you have to observe, comprehend, and eliminate your psychological aggregates. That is the true, the true sacrifice. And then, huh, in terms of lust, there is the, the ego of the peeping Tom. Yes, there is a very cruel aspect of this, of the peeping Tom that walks around and jumps fences and wants to be looking through windows. Completely unnecessary, ridiculous. But we cannot just think that this does not exist inside of us. Because if you happen to be with your family and suddenly out there, there is a person that you see very attractive. And suddenly, well, uh, something happens with the skirt or something happens with the shirt or something happens where the abs are shown and your eyes drift. That is right there. A peeping Tom. And this is one or more of those egos that we have to comprehend. Because why are we doing this? What exactly is this ego looking for? What type of sensation is it craving? What is happening with that sensation gets into the body? How is it affecting your thinking? Your sentiments? How is it affecting how you behave? That level of comprehension invites to call of the Divine Mother and say, Divine Mother, please eliminate this defect. And she will. But we must observe and comprehend. As we speak of all these, there are many sexual actions that are a violence against nature. Whenever man and woman, moved by lust, come into sexual contact, even if they are not adultering, when the man is not ready and he forces himself into the act, that is a violence against nature. When the woman is not ready, and the man forces himself in the woman. Oof, that is violence against nature. Of course, trying to force a child, a creature that has not developed physically and subject them to a sexual act, that is a violence against nature as well. For example, when a woman is in her period, when her body is getting rid of all of these deleterious substances, well, the body, the female physicality needs of this creative magnetic pause so that it can get rid of this that it does not need so that it can make itself ready once again. But if all that is happening, the man is subjecting the woman into sexual actions. All of those deleterious substances, they harm both the man and the woman. And that constitutes violence against nature. Incest, rape, bestiality, all of this is considered violence against nature. And there is a key takeaway behind this. It is considered violence against nature because nature is the product of creation. Creation is a manifestation of Abba and Aima in the Kabbalistic tradition. Abba and Aima are the Shiva Shakti of the Hindus. Abba and Aima are the, is the Holy Spirit of the Christians. And when we are using the act of creation to harm 
creation itself. A violence against nature is indeed a crime against the Holy Spirit. And it has been written, All sins will be forgiven except the sins against the Holy Spirit. So now that you heard that list, likely you heard that list and you said, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Great. But if there's anything that you have thought of doing, think it twice. And don't give yourself that additional extra burden. And then there is also, in terms of lust, the exhibitionist. <laughs> well, people, we're all more or less exhibitionist. These days, well, uh, some people will say, oh, I want to wear this because this looks cute. Or I would like to look this because this is so that. Well, uh, observation clearly indicates that many of those clothing preferences, they emphasize certain attributes in the body. And some of these will allow to see more in terms of flesh or see more in terms of shapes or anything that, that, that magnifies the sexuality. So we cannot just think that these things do not exist in us. Certainly, the ego is one, it is three, and it is seven, but it is also a legion of many different faces. And if behind every thought and behind every action there is an ego, then we are all compelled to maintain the remembrance of self at every moment so that we can see how we are interacting with others, how things, as they happen around us, how those things affect us, how they affect our thinking, our sentiments, our actions. And every time that we catch ourselves there, it is a good idea for us to stop, take a deep breath, and to observe what is happening in our mind, to observe what is happening with our sentiments, to see what is it that we would like to go out and do and think, just for a second. Is this an action that contributes? It is something that helps make things better. And if you have absolute certainty, well, by all means. But if you have any doubt, then there should be no doubt. And you should just stop and invoke of your innermost and ask for the guidance that we all need. There is an aspect of lust that is the dancer. Oof. And dancing, those of you who were born and were young in the 80s, you must have enjoyed a lot of dancing. <laughs> Very different dancing than today. But the dancer likes the music that is not harmonious, but the music that is rhythmical. Particularly the one that has a deep bass. Because that deep bass, as it shocks, it invites inferior passions in man that awaken those moments of lust. And of course, there are also aspects of lust that are very specific about pornography. Anything that has to do with the sense of hearing, anything that has to do with the sense of sight, pornography capitalizes on those two senses and captivates the audience in such a way that it makes them its slaves. So we have to know better. Now that we have seen this, now we know where is the danger lurks. And now we are better equipped to not make mistakes. We have sourced the material tonight from some else. Three works, The Great Rebellion, The Revolutionary Psychology, and The Revolution of the Dialectic. So dear friends, this has been our lecture tonight on The Many Faces of the Ego, Part 1. Thank you everyone for being here with us this evening, and may all beings be happy.